let me just very quickly introduce uh, Eric, um, Eric Leibeck, who's going to talk on the university revolution since 1800. Eric um, is American by, by origin, as you will detect very easily, um, but came over to this country, did his PhD at Cambridge, uh, works at the University of Exeter briefly, I think, uh, before going to Manchester, where, he's where he is one of the presidential academic fellows which is an interesting scheme that uh, Manchester run. They managed to fund what, about 100 of these into academic fellows, um, basically appointments, research appointments, turning into more academic appointments as they go along. Um, Eric, you're very, very welcome. We're looking thank forward you. to hearing from you. So over to you. Well, uh, thank you, John, for inviting me and to uh, um, everyone for having me. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Um, uh, I'm, the, I'm currently at the Institute of Education at Manchester. Uh, my background is in sociology, um, but the topic area I research is really the sociology of higher education. And so um, this kind of discussion is, is sort of a work in progress. It's part of a book that I'm writing um, that is somewhat more theoretical than um, my doctorate, which was on uh, German higher education in the 19th century. Um, my postdoctoral um, project was a Leverhulme-funded early career fellowship on British education. So I kind of feel like I've covered Germany, Britain, and America um, across these periods and, and just wanted to try and pull out um, almost a new historically grounded understanding of what universities are doing in since this period because uh, it's, it's interesting a really basic question which is in you know 200 years ago um, a tiny tiny percentage of people went to university it really wasn't a big deal uh, it was re re related to the clergy uh, in Europe and um, some other professions, but um, now we're at a condition where there's about 50% of uh, young people go to university. Uh, Simon Martinson talks about the high, high um, uh, I think it's the high participation nations, and, and, and we'll talk a bit about that, but sort of going back to why were universities set up as they were in the first place has been this kind of lingering question and one that I haven't found previous histories um, and historical sociology have been adequate explaining and in part that's because a lot of these were written in the 1950s and 60s in the immediate post-war period and they kind of have more to say about that period of time than they do about what was actually going on in the 19th century. So that's what this project is, and um, um, the University Revolution is, is the title of a book I'm working on very, very slowly. It probably was supposed to have been written by now, but it's still going. So I'd be really interested in any of your comments on this work. So essentially what I'm trying to do here with the, this historical sociology of education is to shift uh, a bit further past what I would consider the sociology of education is being very much focused on how society influences educational outcomes. A lot of these are social inequalities, uh, different um, disadvantages, different ways social backgrounds and so forth influence who goes to especially university and, and then what happens to uh, folks later. And that's an interesting set of questions, but I think it's, it's kind of a limited set of questions and that the sociology of education can actually ask for range of other questions and in particular we can think about the ways in which professionals especially those who are educated at higher education um, actually then go on and are kind of some of the leading drivers uh, and most powerful actors in society so this sort of line is actually much more of a circle where there's, there's this kind of constant feedback of, of folks who are getting educated who then go into work who then change society, who then go, who, and then that might then change uh, education. And so if you put this across a time axis, 
you have what is essentially a processual um, historical trend that uh, may or may not be um, accessible to understanding. So what I'm trying to do is, that's what I would consider the difference between uh, what is called a processual sociology. I'm using especially Norbert Elias, figurational sociologist Norbert Elias, um, as well as Andrew Abbott, who does a lot of work on professions um, and is rooted in the kind of Chicago school tradition. Um, but I'm trying to put some of these folks together and look at this kind of constant uh, transformation and this kind of cycling of, of a process rather than necessarily just it being a, a kind of a meta narrative, like you might have gotten in modernization theory, which set up um, a sort of a story about what higher education is for, but I still think is with us today. So what I've done so far is, is to kind of just sketch out the way that I think about this in case it's useful, which is that there's kind of two phases that take place in the 19th and 20th centuries. The first is this transformation of the medieval university which has a particular role in medieval societies, um, especially rooted in the church, and then the shift to a modern university, which is uh, for a broader set of elites. And that's one really important phase that has its own dynamics. And then what happens, especially in the 20th century, is that elite university then becomes a mass university. Um, and that's a sort of other set of dynamics, but a lot of the contradictions that were embedded in the first phase actually just um, produce um, further uh, problems in the second phase and, and kind of lead us to think differently. So I'm looking at four national contexts, France, Germany, America, and Britain. France probably gets the least treatment from me, but um, a lot of the arguments I've made elsewhere are, is that France, through the work of Bourdieu especially, is really well understood as this kind of pyramid, centralized, uh, kind of reproducing elites, um, and ultimately rooted in things like the French Revolution and so forth. And, and what I'm suggesting is actually um, all of these four patterns, all, all of these four cases aren't identical to one another. They're not doing exactly the same thing, but emerging from their interaction is this one global pattern that then the rest of the world kind of copies um, more or less isomorphically, for those of you familiar with John Meyer and New Institutionalism. So the argument I'm making with the, with the idea of the university revolution is that we tend to think about modernity as being the Industrial Revolution and the Democratic Revolution. Um, Karl Marx talks about this, essentially um, Weber, Anthony Giddens also said this, I think Eric Hobsbawm threw out this idea of the dual revolution of the French Revolution and the, um, that's the democratic side, and then the industrial revolution, especially in Britain, and that these are the sort of two main drivers of modernity, and these are sort of economic and political. So what I'm suggesting is actually that there's a third process. It's not, I mean, the industrial revolution took, I think, 150, 200 years, so these aren't exactly speedy anyway, but, um, this, uh, I, I would follow Elias in calling this an academization process that's happening across a few hundred years that's as important as the industrial and democratic revolutions for establishing how modernity or modern societies work. And that happens especially in Germany. And, and that's kind of uh, something that lots of folks know and sort of it's, 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 it's something that historians and sociologists have been acknowledged, but very few of those then go and actually look at what was going on in Germany to, to make this um, university revolution happen, and why did then everyone start to copy this. So as I mentioned, the first phase is this medieval to modern, and, and I spend most of my time trying to work this out, because the 19th century is just, in my view, really quite misunderstood. Um, and part of the reason for that, as I'll explain, is that in the 1950s and 60s, modernization theorists so, sort of suggested that science and technology were everything. And so the reason that this university um, succeeded in Germany were because they created the best laboratories and had this particular PhD system and um, that science and technology were driving this, um, this kind of success of German universities. 
Now, in fact, in all of the cases I'm looking at, um, science and technology is important, but it doesn't seem to actually be driving things to the same extent. And there's actually five key causes or, or, or factors that are interacting with one another in contingent ways that I would see as being most significant, um, but they're not exclusive. There might be others as well, but these are the ones I'm looking at. The first is the decline of aristocracies and the rise of the middle <laughs> class. Um, second is the displacement of religion inside the universities and the curriculum changes that take place. The third is imperial politics. Uh, the fourth is the changing role of women and children. And then last, there is the science and technology that's still important. So uh, with the time I'll have, I have left, I'll, I'll sort of explain each of these rather briefly. So again, science and technology is treated as this thing that's very important. And in a lot of ways, that's actually much more important in the second phase, in the Cold War, in the post-World War II um, <clears throat> era, in, in, the, in the period in which uh, liberal democracies especially tried to latch on to science and technology as the thing that justifies why liberalism is this great um, ideology because it's falsifiable and it's an open society and so forth. And we can also produce all of the goods. We can make all of these refrigerators and technology, iPhones now, that everybody wants. And that's what makes liberal capitalism this great um, society that's better than the alternative, which would be the communist societies, which also emphasize science and technology. But um, according to uh, the liberals who constructed this idea, as well as set down the major theories of, of, and histories of why universities existed. <coughs> um, according to them, communism was an ideology and not scientific, unlike liberalism, which is not ideological and has no ideology. It's completely value neutral. Okay, so that's what um, science and technology is there. It's happening, uh, especially in Germany, is, is sort of leading in chemistry. <laughs> Uh, a lot of that's connected to the military um, and chemicals, um, as, as well as pharmaceuticals and, and just chemicals in general. Um, uh, also engineering, uh, railroads, and so forth. That's all very important. But the key thing that um, the the mis sort of the mistelling of the story by the by the modernization theorists in the 50s was. But they said that the scientists and technologists were driving this push themselves. And whereas the scientists um, benefited from new labs and, and, and work, I've not found much evidence at all that they were really pushing any of this forward. It was mostly civil servants, politicians, professionals, and in fact the leading edge of most of these transformations were in the social sciences, not the natural sciences. So that's the first kind of correction. And then it's a question of why were those folks doing this? And the, the argument that I'm, I'm sort of suggesting this happens in Germany. I can also see it happening in Britain in, in a different way because it's a totally different national context. But one of the main, as, the main trends going on in the 19th century that gets missed in the stories talking about industrial and democratic revolutions and then perhaps leading to a socialist revolution is that the aristocracy were essentially in charge in most national contexts in Europe until at least World War I. And the main struggle was the middle class trying to get into those positions of power. So we tend to think of the 19th century in terms of this capital labor conflict, which is significant, but it's actually the capital old regime conflict that is driving much of um, what's going on, especially in education because that's an elite field. And what they're trying to do is displace uh, the old regime, the aristocracy in terms of politics, in terms of the actual positions in, um, in the context of Germany and the civil service and the bureaucracy administration. Um, the aristocracy retains control of the military and one of the major aspects of a lot of these trends is that whereas almost every other subject and profession gets drawn into the university, militaries remain the separate educational, higher, higher educational institution. And that's one of the major things. And that's where aristocracies retain a kind of uh, familial 
control of, of certainly the officer core. Anyway, um, what's happening in the context of, of, of the industrial and democratic revolutions is um, the aristocracies are descending or declining and the middle classes are ascending. And there's not really a point at which um, one wins out over the other. They just kind of blend into one another in this sort of new elite. And that's what I'm suggesting is actually what's being produced in universities, is this kind of new class that has aspects of both, but is also a third class. It's a genuinely third position because uh, the academics and professionals that make up this university educated class um, on the one hand, are very disdainful of, for example, middle class materialism, uh, consumer habits, their sort of philistinism, uh, they have terrible tastes in architecture and culture and so forth. And in that sense, they think that the aristocracy kind of has some good things about them because they're also disdainful of those things. But, but on the other hand, they, they do support the middle class idea of what we would today call meritocracy and this idea that um, we should have achievements and, and, and sort of um, the people should in positions should be well qualified and trained and, and sort of um, useful. So that's, that's what the new class is doing. And, and what this produces is this kind of, I call it an anti-elitist elitism completely denies the fact that this new, like, that academics or those with qualifications are trying to be elite. It's kind of like, what me? No, no, I'm not. I'm just trying to get a piece of paper that tells me I'm smarter than everyone else in the same field. But it's, I, I don't want power. And so it's very critical of the other forms of power, both the middle class for being um, uh, vulgar and without culture and the aristocracy for being this kind of useless um, uh, aristocracy. And um, both of these classes in their conflicts with one are sort of level claims against one another. And the bourgeois criticism, uh, Gouldner talks about um, the middle class criticism of aristocracies was very, they framed themselves very much in terms of what the aristocracy was not. And so, um, the middle class standard of utility developed in the course of this polemic against the old regimes in which rights of men were derived from estate, class, birth, or lineage, so like ascribed status. In short, what they were rather than what they did. Developed in the course of its struggle against the nobility, the ideology of usefulness was in part a residual concept. The useful was that which the nobility was not. So the nobility was kind of everything that the nobility does that's terrible, so wasting money, not paying taxes, leisure, unusual sexuality, all those things were considered um, the opposite of middle class values and sort of then you get the black coats and the top hats and the um, industry and utility and usefulness is this really key idea. So the middle class wants to enter especially in, now I'm shifting over to Britain, in Cambridge and Ox, Oxford, the high, um, the Anglican church, is, the establishment church is really controlling um, the access to what is considered valid knowledge. And most of this is rooted in a classical curriculum that went all the way back through uh, the public schools and the grammar schools. And it was, it was sort of just training for Greek and Latin perhaps a bit of mathematics, but it was to enter essentially the priesthood. And then there was this idea that that type of education might also be marginally useful for aristocrats. Um, those graduates might then go on to be tutors for um, important um, figures, uh, political leaders and so forth. But what the middle class in order to enter this kind of establishment, what they needed to do was undermine not the aristocracy because they were just the students really, they needed to make the clergy's classical curriculum appear useless. And so all of the claims were sort of, why do we need to know Latin? Why do we need to know Greek? No one needs to know this. We should learn modern foreign languages. We should learn 
mathematics, science, econom political economy, um, moral philosophy, English literature. So most of the kind of subjects that we would recognize today, other than theology, theology would have been like the central discipline. And then they had to more or less make that a specialization alongside classics. And then everything else could be added as this kind of, and it just sort of led to this proliferation of specialized disciplines rather than this kind of perhaps archaic, but ultimately coherent kind of uh, um, core curriculum that was rooted in a classical humanism. It's, it, Erasmus was probably the central figure in the 16th century. So um, the way I understand this is, a, Again, using Andrew Abbott to look at changes of um, professional jurisdiction. And that's professions are claiming jurisdiction over certain areas of knowledge, of practice, of work, and they, they sort of make these claims in competition with other professions. And so what I'm doing in analyzing this sort of displacement of clergy and religion is looking at this as a professional jurisdiction problem, where the middle classes um, and the academics that are supporting the utilitarian uh, positions are trying to displace the clergy as a profession, um, as well as um, trying to bring in things like science into medicine and, and, and so forth. So I won't go into this very much because I don't want to take up all of my time with this, but uh, the source I use for this are, are, are actually novels, 19th century novels. There's these conflicts over jurisdiction are happening all the time. In Andrew <laughs> Trollope's novels, in this instance, it's uh, George Eliot's um, Middle March, where there's a scene um, at a Midlands town over a uh, dinner table asking whether they should appoint the new chaplain, um, should be appointed by the middle class banker or left to the medical board um, and uh, the medical doctor who's been trained in, in, in advocating all this sort of science says appointments are apt to be made too much question of personal liking. If you want to get a reform, you pension off the good fellows who everyone is fond of and put them out of the question. So you get rid of all the local people that everyone likes and then you try and look for the, um, the, most, the person with the highest merit, the most qualifications. And then the coroner, who would at this time be a lawyer, is saying, you never hear of a reform, but it means some trick to put in new men. I hope you're not one of the Lancet's men. Wanted to take the coronership out of the hands of the legal profession. Uh, he then goes on to say, um, a lawyer is no better than an old woman at a post-mortem examination. How is he to know the action of a poison? You might as well say that scanning verse will teach you to scan the potato crops. And then ultimately the, the hosts this says, I, I don't know anything about this. And this probably just God is the best person to leave the question to. So there's this kind of problem area, which is on the one hand coronership. It's, it's also the, the question of the chaplaincy. And there's these different professions competing over who, um, who should be in charge. And that's, that's an example. Of, of this jurisdictional conflict, and, and there's several of these um, instances within universities. Um, and as I mentioned, once once the clergy gets displaced, uh, what I've done is um, I've been tracking. Um, it, well, I won't get into all the methods, but I, I've gone especially to Oxford colleges, but um, have, have touched on a few other universities as well. And what you can see is um, over time, uh, the professions that are the expectations for what the student is going to university to then become changes across the 19th century. So initially you start to not just have clergy, you also have schoolmasters. Um, one of the big interventions is the Indian Civil Service exam, which is also coming up in Ireland and Scotland where these are points at which merit starts to enter in, and it's this process uh, Midgate was talking about, of trying to displace the old people who are considered, um, and anyone who's read Trollope, the warden is all about, like there's this perfectly good warden, but because he's not been qualified, he's kind of pushed out. 
and, and replaced by someone who um, I think that they just get rid of the position. And this happens over and over again at the Oxford colleges. They're trying to get rid of old wills that say what the scholarship should be for and replace them with entrance exams. And so the initial examinations that get introduced are initially for what would today be called um, uh, what, junior research fellows, like the JRFs and postdoctoral early fellowships. That then gets filtered down into student admissions and, and into, um, and then once that gets filtered down, then the headmasters of schools start to train their students and that really flips from a classical curriculum to what we would today recognize as modern. Anyway, I'm going to jump through this, but this is, um, it takes all the way up to 1960 for Cambridge to get rid of um, the requirement that Latin and Greek be, um, and, and throughout this, the justification is always that scientists don't need Latin and Greek. Um, and uh, so they're wasting their time learning this and, was, and Cambridge and Oxford are losing students to Imperial and the University of London, and Edinburgh and so forth. And so what they should do is replace it with German or modern foreign language is something more useful. So if there's time, we'll get back into that again. So that's two out of the five things. Um, the third is imperial politics. And a very important part of this is, is what you would recognize as um, colonialism and uh, um, kind of European powers colonizing um, uh, the, the empire, um, India, Africa, and so forth. Um, and that's a very important uh, story, but actually um, I think even more important is um, inter-imperial competition. So especially Germany and the threat Germany poses once it becomes an empire in 1871, because it really, it, it quite unexpectedly just rolls over France in, in the Franco-Christian War. And all of a sudden you start to see people in Britain talking about how they need to reproduce what Germany is doing. And the thing that they find Germany doing is constructing these universities. And so you see this in America, uh, the, the, the folks traveling to Germany to see what their universities do they're all they're all using this idea of Germany as the most advanced nation empire now, and that's the future. And so what we need to do is, is emulate their uh, military on the one hand, but also their higher education. So the case I spend a, a, a lot of time looking at is the University of Strasbourg, which is founded in um, 1872, right after the Franco-Prussian War. And just to give you a set, and this is the first university founded in Germany. Uh, since 1822. Um, the big transformation was the University of Berlin in 1810, which was the first to um, uh, award PhDs and also um, added this separate um, philosophical faculty. Um, so that, and, and, and that sort of set the terms within Germany in the period between 1810 and 1870. But this University of Strasbourg was set up um, after the Franco Oppression War, and it was a very explicitly, um, this quote tells you that it was to turn, how do you turn Alsatians, who were naturally German, but have been essentially living in France for 200 years, how do you turn them back into Germans? Well, um, if you establish a German university, you will be assured that it will work wonders towards the goal. So it's very explicitly sort of cultural imperialism, trying to project and, and sort of convert um, populations into German uh, uh, culture, German ethnicity. And you can see the way that this was done. These are the old uh, fortifications set up by Louis XIV in Strasbourg. Um, this is a modern map in 1900 where you can see, it's difficult to see, but the university is along the top edge of those walls. So they essentially knock down the entire northern wall that's facing Germany um, and they put the university on where the walls were. So that 
wall was basically replaced by universities um, that would have been just in, in their imaginary, that's, that's sort of German border almost, and it's sort of we're coming at you with our couture and so forth. But Strasbourg did a number of things. They sent out um, a survey to all the German academics and said, what do you think the ideal German university consists of? So this was uh, no single German university actually had these features, but they sort of collated all of these um, insights and put them all together and then set up Strasbourg to be the ideal German university that didn't actually exist anywhere and also didn't end up existing in Strasbourg for a whole series of reasons. But what they did was they developed the seminar system, which is um, essentially the first departmental structure. So whereas you might have had professors of different subjects, uh, chairs at different universities that might have run a seminar, in this instance, every um, professor would have had uh, funding to run seminars of their most advanced PhD students. Um, running essentially what we're doing now, we're actually sort of doing the same, <laughs> where, where, where the department would get together and, and sort of discuss the <coughs> latest innovations and, and then new scholars would come in and, and, and these were the sites of patronage for up and coming academics and so forth, um, but it was broken into specific disciplines as well. And so the philosophical faculty was split into arts and sciences very explicitly and that's one of the first times that's happened where sciences and arts are split. But also social sciences were <coughs> also there right from the beginning. Um, and they had some of the most significant uh, seminars, including uh, Gustav Schmolders founded German uh, historical economics there, and so forth. Uh, and I just want to mention the secretary was this fellow Friedrich Althoff, who's very important later on. But he was the secretary to um, Franz, Baron Franz von Rogenbach, who um, was put in charge of making this University of Strasbourg. Um, and so I'll talk, I spend a lot of time looking at his biography. But what's significant is not so much Strasbourg itself, but this is the exact moment that American university presidents are coming to Europe to say, we want to establish graduate schools of the European style. Initially, they think they're going to go to France, go to places like Sciences Po. Um, but 1871 happens in Germany, um, defeats France quite um, embarrassingly for France. Because um, France would have the grand Ecoles and the specialized schools, uh, the, the sort of um, engineering schools and whatnot, and all very kind of specialized, but not a university. Like the university was retained in Germany because they couldn't afford to make new buildings, so they kept the old monasteries, but they were forced to modernize because of the uh, French imperial conquest of Germany for about 10, 15 years in the French Revolution. Anyway, that's all detailed. Point is, uh, Daniel Coit Gilman comes and travels to Strasbourg and sees all of the libraries and laboratories that they've set up there. John Burgess, who's central in making uh, Columbia University in New York, also um, travels there to visit. And you can see the way this gets transferred over. Um, so this is the first uh, Department of History and Politics, Johns Hopkins is the first university of the German style. It's just a graduate institution. And the place where they, um, they do their research is called the seminary. And it, this is very much the structure of a German uh, seminar uh, with the books and so forth. Woodrow Wilson was one of the first students there, as was Albion Small, who founded sociology. And lots of the most significant um, early social scientists were in this class. <coughs> um, don't want to use up all of my time on this. But by the time you've reached 1900, um, Germany is starting to become aware of its influence in the field of higher education and starts to develop an explicit policy of what they call cultural imperialism. And uh, they developed this program to what they, they call to unite the German Germanic tribes. So they basically want to create a, a, a sort of transnational Germanic civilization um, 
that uh, would include the Dutch, the Flemish, Danish, Swedish, Norwegians, and very importantly, German Americans, who were the largest immigrant population. The, well, the largest white European population in America were German Americans um, then and actually still today, um, and other German folk. So, um, so what they want to do is bring all of German science and knowledge together, um, and that this will be uh, an advanced stage, so they're going to sort of unite the intellectual culture through science first, and then that will aid in diplomacy and markets and so forth. Um, so what they do is they set up this um, really, uh, they do a model version of the Charlottenburg Palace at the 1904 World's Fair, which they don't realize America's already so into neoclassical architecture, the whole World's Fair already looks like that. They thought it would be this like amazing spectacle, but actually you can barely spot it. It's just right there. Um, this is now part of the campus of the University of um, Washington, St. Louis, or what well, might be Washington University. Um, anyway, at the World's Fair, the diplomats involved in organizing this decide they should set up um, a German-American professorial exchange. And this happens, um, John W. Burgess, who I mentioned earlier, has already set up uh, the first graduate school of um, political science, uh, in, and also essentially created the graduate school of Columbia University, which made Columbia a university rather than a college. Um, so he, along with Nicholas Murray Butler, who was the president of Columbia, meet with Theodore Roosevelt in the White House to discuss this German-American professorial exchange. Um, and they go to meet with Friedrich Althoff, who I mentioned earlier was the secretary setting up this University of Strasbourg. He's now in charge of the ministry for, um, it's like the cultural ministry and in charge of universities. He's written about quite often by folks like Max Weber, for creating what's called the Althoff system that organized the German higher education system for the last 20 years of the 19th century. He sort of um, is responsible for the German higher ed system. So anyway, they meet uh, in Wilhelm's Hall and Castle and discuss this German soil exchange. And John W. Burgess becomes the first uh, uh, Roosevelt. Oh, no. Yeah, it's the first um, Roosevelt professor at the University of Berlin. He gives this big speech um, near the Brandenburg Gate. Uh, and quite controversially, he says, the best interests of the United States will be promoted by a large Teutonic immigration to South America so that the colonization of that giant continent through people capable of a high culture would be assured through people who feel the needs of civilization and demand their satisfaction. To people also who recognize the responsibilities of civilization and are willing to comply with them. So um, there's several of these instances where they're essentially starting to work together to organize this Germanic, transnational, American, German, Scandinavian uh, sort of uh, domination of the uh, uh, culture worldwide and so on, as well as this, this explicit migration. Althoff gets sick, and Burgess goes to um, visit him, and this is just um, an interesting quote uh, in this very telling, uh, it's like told in this very sentimental way by Burgess about what Althoff said to him. He says it's the most promising undertaking of our age, which contains the seeds of artistic cultural development on a scale like no other. Future requires that the people and not merely the governments come together, and this is done fast and fastest when the scholars of all nations meet and come into contact with students of different nations. Diplomacy and trade we have had for a long time. Now we must add to this the disinterested intellectual traffic between cultural leaders. This will provide the solid foundations for world peace and global culture. Now all of that sounds kind of like soft power, international education, international scientific exchange, and so forth. Um, but this is where they, he then says, in particular, the Germanic nations should promote and develop the exchange of scholars, especially between Germany and the United States. These two nations must precede all others in spiritual development, not only because they are the two greatest Germanic nations of both hemispheres, but also because they have higher 
spiritual or intellectual qualities than any other. So that's, that's kind of the idea. And this is in 1906. So this is like well along the process and it's kind of accelerating. I mean, with Theodore Roosevelt, they're working together to establish this uh, link. Theodore Roosevelt sends a note that Burgess delivers saying that it's, it's uh, one of the great features of American intellectual life that the leaders of our universities were trained in German universities and that, that makes them very, uh, that makes them world leading and so forth. Now what happens in the interim is World War I and complete rejection of everything Germanophilic becomes sort of Germanophobic. And in America in particular, there's this sort of like real rage against all of these German Americans who uh, there's several historical studies of how they changed they used to be quite proud to be German Americans. They were one of the first hyphenated Americans, which Roosevelt gives a speech against hyphenation and encouraging assimilation in this context. And he's talking about German Americans. So they decide to call themselves white rather than German Americans. So this is like a huge moment where one of the largest hyphenated populations decides we're now white. And then um, Irish Americans try to do similar things, Polish Americans uh, down the line, and everyone just kind of starts this race to become white, European. But um, in this, at this point, Germans were still um, considered uh, at least different. Okay, I've already, I feel like I've used up most of my time, but that one is, is, is a big case that I've spent a lot of time in my doctorate looking at Germany. Um, Another thing I've started to look into, and, and I'm still um, kind of doing more of this, but one of the things that starts to change in the 19th century is um, childhood starts to become identified as a separate space from adulthood. And this is something driven especially by middle class philanthropists. A lot of these social scientists that I've talked about as leading these shifts towards knowledge, medicine, public health, um, um, law, criminology is really important at this point. Um, <coughs> as part of their challenge against, so the middle classes are starting to define childhood as being particularly um, organized around the absence of work. So childhood is a space for play, leisure, imagination, it's not work. But yet they have to go to school and that will eventually lead them to work. And so there's this real clear division between adults work and children don't work, which then down the line starts to become, we need to get rid of child labor. We need to start to educate all of these children, not just our own children, um, in order to make sure that um, all children have access to this ideal kind of um, more or less middle class um, education. So that, and then that will then give them all the opportunities and so forth that they like. Aristocrats are also very involved in, in sort of charitably founding schools and so forth in this period. Um, and so there's the, but the big thing I want to note is that there's this clear division now between childhood and adulthood. And this leads to this idea of like a, a citizen or a man, a full member of adult society is first of all a man. They're also educated um, in a, a university. Uh, they may have gone through their days playing sports and so forth at university, but by the time they have the diploma in their back, now they're ready to take on the world and now they're, they're supposed to give up all of those things and now they're a full citizen. But the the first reaction to this actually comes from women who are very immediately saying, well, we uh, can get educated too. So if education is the precondition for participation in society, then we should um, also um, on the one hand have access to higher education and then in, by extension political suffrage and, and, and economic inequalities and so forth. And one of the very important things in Britain on this is that suffrage comes quite late for all men 
And so women had already been involved in politics in ways that other uh, elite men would have been involved in politics, which is through knowing a local MP or um, meeting with someone in a, in a charitable event and so forth. And so it was only as suffrage starts to expand for men that this real disconnect starts to happen where women are saying, um, we can do all of those things that you're saying are the qualifications to participate in political uh, society and economic society. I could get into that more, but that's a, that would take a while. I just gave a, a paper on that recently. But what starts to emerge in this context is, is a, this kind of tension between what I call the girton Newnham debate, where the first Cambridge colleges, um, Girton has, uh, founded by Emily Davies, has this position that says, um, women can do anything that men can do, and therefore we will take all of the same exams, we will do all of the same qualifications, and to suggest that women couldn't do that is admitting a form of inequality, and therefore we, that, that's unacceptable, because women are capable of doing everything men can do. <coughs> Newnham is set up by Anne Clough, uh, and William Sidgwick, the utilitarian philosopher. And they're drawing on a different cohort of students, a lot of them commuting, uh, doing what would be called distance learning, a lot of them from essentially middle class families from north of England. And they were coming to Cambridge, and in particular the mathematics uh, uh, entrance exams were a problem. So what they decided was that they would change the entrance exams to encourage more participation. So this tension between women can do everything the same as men and we need to change standards to maximize participation for this historically excluded group. This tension now runs through all of um, the rest of kind of higher education. And I still think that's a tension, certainly in Oxford, they're managing that tension and, and constantly weighing up issues with women. So even um, in the 1970s when the suggestion of co-ed colleges comes up, um, they're worried that the women's colleges will lose out because at the time the best qualified women were going to Somerville and, and the top uh, women's colleges and they were worried that with co-education that those best women would then go to St. John's and um, Trinity and the, and the best male colleges thereby making the women's colleges look not as good because they don't have the same. And that tension between sort of what would be called like merit or ability and um, participation and inclusion, that goes all the way. There's a, I was looked at the university entrance exams at Oxford and they, they sort of did these reviews year after year all the way up until the year 2000, which is when the Office for Fair Access gets set up. And then they sort of just stop and get rid of all of this question about ability and just turn to these are the percentages of different cohorts, women, men, state schools, private schools, and they just start reporting the percentages and this whole sort of tension gets lost. Anyway, um, I'm going to dash through this, but if anyone has questions about how this is related, um, one of the things that's quite significant is that a lot of women were involved in articulating what a university is for. And people like George Elliott, who I mentioned earlier, um, Marianne um, uh, Lewis or Evans, um, she was also really central in um, motivating some of the red brick founders. So John Percival, who went on to found Bristol, University of Bristol. Um, there are various points at which um, the particular position that women were taking at this time were not just influencing women's experience of higher education. And a lot of the history of women's higher education rightly focuses on how, does, how, how did women experience, like what were student societies like, what were the challenges, and all that's very uh, important. But for this question that I have, it's how does that question of women's higher education influenced the kind of core structure of what university education 
is, is for and what it's like. And so that's uh, the fourth uh, factor. All, of, all four, so there's the class changes, there's the displacing of clergy, there's the imperialism, and there's the women uh, and ch children uh, and their changing roles. Those are not happening in a linear way, but they're all kind of interacting with each other in these four national contexts. And over time, it does establish this general pattern. I'm just going to go straight through. And, and it's actually this issue of science and technology. Yes, there are these significant points at which chemical engineering and railroads and, and eventually the space program and so on are influencing science and technological development. Um, but it's actually this ideology of science that comes out of this period that is saying the reason why academics, professionals, and, and um, uh, women, um, the, the leading imperial powers, why, why all of these folks should be in charge or, or should have access to positions of authority or because they have been trained in science and technology. So, so it's actually this ideology of science and technology that is um, most significant in why these universities are, are being founded, why they're expanding, why they're starting to um, enroll new cohorts and so forth. And um, uh, Tolka Parsons noted that, um, that the university was the most significant institution in, in constructing modern society. And that's something I think um, we've lost sense of, which is why I'm trying to bring back this university revolution idea. It's like, yes, we can study universities, we can study who has access to universities, those are all important questions, but actually we also should go back and say the fact that young people are now um, studying at about 50% um, of the young people are being educated in this very particular way and then going into work into positions of power um, that's actually doing something to society like that, that has already done things to society that we need to take account of, account of and then perhaps we can better understand a whole range of, of other things so this is just um, a very quick um, graph to show how significant the second phase is, where you can see the, the vast increase of students in the UK, USA, um, and, and in general the OECD, but that's actually dwarfed. So that, that, red, that red graph down there, which looks like a big spike, is a tiny <laughs> line between the developing nations and the world in general. So there's now a condition where people all over the world are entering this higher education system. And um, in a lot of ways, I think that we need to go back to that early Germanic idea of essentially cultural imperialism and this idea of uniting uh, the world's um, culture through higher education. Not necessarily because I'm immediately saying uh, everybody's now like a Nazi or something for doing that, although those folks did go on to promote Arianism and all sorts of really terrible things. But I think that, that to, to know that those were the origins, uh, at least a partial origin, of, of why the world is structured as it is around this sector um, is just a bit more accurate and more space for reflection than the one that says, well, everyone loves science and technology, so that's why universities were set up. So that's, that's essentially the big message I'm trying to push. But, it's, as I said, it's a work in progress, so I'm really just grateful for you all listening. So I'd be really interested in your questions. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> a lot of uh, food for thought, I think, in that. Um, can I just invite anybody to go and top up the tea and coffee and grab another biscuit? Um, in the meantime, can I invite any comments or questions. Thanks for that. Um, very, very interesting. Um, I'm thinking about the, um, the sort of the role of science and technology and that, that, that tends to be around, around my sort of field. And 
It seems to me that there are two things that were happening in terms of science and technology. One was to do with, with the thinking that was coming out of, of science. So you take people like Newton and Darwin, and actually the thinking that came from them was actually transforming other, other ways of thinking and behaving. And you could argue that that had a, a radical influence upon the way that religion was being seen and discussed, for example, which then went on in other ways. And, you know, there is this argument then that that actually developed in terms of this sort of technology, in terms of creation. So you've got the observational power of science, and then you've got the creative power of technology. And, and this sort of idea that, if you like, um, science and technology is bringing forth truth which is countering this concept of belief <coughs> and, and, and this sort of idea of where that fits in terms of universities and how they were evolving seems, seems to me to be an interesting one. Um, I mean, especially in the current context where it seems to me that, um, you know, in, one could argue that actually politics to some extent now seems to be reliant more upon belief than it is upon truth. But, you know, that's, that's a separate argument, maybe. But I was wondering what, 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 your, what your sort of response and the thoughts would be on that as to whether that would, whether you feel that that would make any sort of sense in terms of what you've seen in terms of that, that, that progression, that, that evolution, if you like, over time. Mm -hmm. um. Yes, definitely. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I'm, I'm sort of going back to 17th century scientific revolution, Newton, and so on. And there's certainly a uh, train transformation of ways of thinking that then leads to different forms of religious belief, deism, Unitarianism, nonconformity. That is much more associated with the liberal middle classes in general, um, uh, the Whigs and so forth. And at the time of, at the start of this period, 1800, um, it's generally considered worldwide that the leading university in the world was Edinburgh. And that's where they did, they, that's coming right out of the Scottish Enlightenment um, and the kind of common sense philosophy and they, the Edinburgh Review was regularly criticizing Oxbridge for this old, out-of-date, archaic. And um, so I think that the, the discourse is there that you're describing of creativity, efficiency, utility, Adam Smith is writing about um, division of labor and so on, and commerce, and, 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 and this idea of like you could potentially rationalize things like trade or taxes or production and so on. But I think that the, the thing that I'm always kind of trying to push back into this story is that they were still a minority lobbying for change. And who was the majority? Who were the people in power? Were the Establishment Church of England, the Tories, Wellington, and really old regime type folks, um, the folks running the Royal Navy, the folks running the, um, um, and, 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 you know, eventually the conservative party sort of liberalizes a bit. You have Peel and, and this kind of influence, uh, you know, the same way David Cameron sort of liberalized the conservative party, but it doesn't make not much difference in the, in the long term when it just goes back to as it was. And I think that there's this kind of constant push and pull in these directions. But I think that what really changes universities, because all of that outside of Scotland, um, all of that's more or less happening outside of the universities. And people like Maxwell are, are, are encouraged to keep their experiments secret and so on. Um, so, so, so it's really not until the end of the century and the civ when the civics start to get established and they don't have a theology faculty and they uh, immediately enroll women usually um, as, as, as allowed to do their entrance exams and, and get degrees and so on. 
And they're also, um, if you look at their founding documents and the letters sent back and forth between the people funding these initiatives and the kind of local association setting up places like Bristol, it's the threat of Germany is like constant. They're, they're sort of constantly saying, we don't have a choice. We have to set up our universities around this idea of science and technology. And then in the 1930s and 40s, Eric Ashby and all sorts of folks then say, yeah, it was all the scientific revolution. And that's not to discount the genuine change of thinking that influenced Christopher Wren and, and, and the way 17th century was run and, and all of the genuine influence of the scientific revolution. But that's not enough to make universities scientific, I think. I think it's Germany that's the one that decides to do that. So that's, that's what I would say. Well, thanks very much. I thought this was really, really good and fascinating. Really enjoyed it. Um, also, really interesting because a lot of the literature talks about the importance of nation building of that time. So it's really interesting to see how you make this subordinate to this sort of cultural imperialism and so on. But my questions are um, basically about your concluding thoughts, so the way you started in, the, in terms of how these findings can help us think about um, the universities of today. And, um, and I'm going to try to make this comment as coherent as I can, so <laughs> bear with me. But it seems to me that um, you would need to also keep in mind the changing circumstances. So these kind of cultural imperialist struggles back then, if we now fast forward to 100 years and think about um, uh, culture versus economy and also that little nice graph that you had, you know, educating from civil service to consumers and so on. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you, you said from uh, uh, that if we educate 50% of um, cohort today, what does it do to our society? But my question then is, if we have changing nation states that do not, that have a very different kind of cultural imperialistic struggles that are very much more economic, you have global actors, companies who are coming into the higher education sector, unbundling universities, etc. It must be some sort of different kind of university project that we are seeing. So, so you know, you have two phases, uh, medieval to modern and then elite to mass. So I wonder if there's any to think about a third phase from mass to something else. Mm -hmm. And potentially mass higher education would be a phase in the history in a sense, which is sensible because, you know, you have all these um, social, political, cultural struggles that happen in time. So my question really is, how are you, um, or what are you doing with the, with the more, let's say, recent decades, if you are thinking about universities of today? Or, I mean, I appreciate your talk was really focused today on 19th century, uh, but yet you're trying to make it relevant for sure. today's university. See what I mean? I mean, yeah. I'm sorry. I was no, 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 that's fine. Uh, I, I didn't want to go to the um, concluding slides because it starts to get a bit more messy mm. as, I tr as, as it's kind of like, why do we need to know all that to understand sort of today? And I think that's very likely that there is this sort of, it could be a transition phase from mass to say universal or something like that. Or going, back, or going backwards, yeah, yeah, that's also, I think, I think the contradictions within the transformation towards mass is that, first of all, it's organized by folks who have graduated from these institutions. So the ideology is already there, that that's the way towards social position. So social mobility is you can be more like us and, and you can become educated and then you can participate in society. And that's the big tension in the 19th century is because they're starting to see democracy start to happen and they don't want all of the uneducated rabble sort of un undermining the, uh, the system. And so the, the sort of compromise is, well, once people become educated, then they can start to um, engage in these areas of power and so on. 
But the problem is that that kind of works as a system um, when you have, you know, 10, 15 percent of the population. And even then, they're talking about over uh, credentialization, academic proletariat in like 1880s mm -hmm. and stuff. So they're already thinking that's way too much. But once we go to 50 percent, then the, the link between social position and credentials is almost completely, it's just gone. Like, to, to get an education is not only just not a guarantee, it's, it's, it's really just like a precondition to do anything. And it, and it doesn't really provide a, any particular social. So in that sense, we've also now created this whole generation or two based off of a promise that if you go through school, get good grades, go out to higher education, you'll get a job, a good job. And there's, but meanwhile, the good jobs are shrinking. So we're just producing more applicants for the same jobs and then uh, just sort of making new professions uh, require degrees that didn't used to, like police sergeants and so forth. So that's one direction in which this is still, the, 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 by not reflecting on the actual system that has been expanded, we're missing that. But then the other side is the whole 50% that then doesn't go to university, who um, also have jobs being um, lost and so forth. And in an additional sense, they're also not um, socialized into this culture so that they're starting to be what I would consider a genuine bifurcation of culture that you can see played out in things like Brexit, Trump, and, and the correlations between educational credentials. And so you lead to this issue of like truth. It's like there's two, at least two truths that are mutually uh, incommensurable in a lot of ways. And that's because um, one group has been educated in a particular way. Uh, and, and has a certain baseline of, of knowledge and understanding of how the world works. And another group, I don't, I don't even know, but doesn't seem to have the same understanding of how the world works. And more or less, it's just developing resentment of the former group, regardless of whether that's deserved or not. And it's just, it, you know, the culture wars and all the rest of it are a product of this educational stratification system. So those are some of the points I think it's relevant today. Yes. Can we take this? Yeah. Um, thank you. I mean, thank you so much. Uh, it was uh, very, <laughs> all, a lot of thoughts. Um, I mean, what I can really see in the part, the part that I was really interested in is like the German and America kind of tried to do things together. So I feel for me, it's really coming from the really ruling class ruling their power upon people to like biopolitics, like from code's term, like really trying to get people sorted out based on the disciplined knowledge system and like really system of thought and knowledge. It's, it's so much easier if you really try to like go to like developed country, uh, developing country and say, this is knowledge that you have to learn. It's quite difficult to replicate that, but it's the system of university and that's how buildings work. And then this is like the policy that we developed. And then this is what you can mimic it. And then that's so much easier to go beyond the global level of, you know, get that biopolitics goes back, uh, back. So, so, I mean, that was kind of observation. And then I was really wondering because, uh, one of my areas is globalization of a higher education, and we really buy into this discourse that we are really like trying to equalize this society and point. And then actually that kind of discussion with that those people have between German and America was actually really maybe what is happening beyond, but we couldn't really say that openly that anymore because it should be really hidden because we, we have that done that. So I'm just wondering from your phase that may, moving from the first phase and second phase in terms of the massification of higher education and going global, have you seen any of those very similar kind of, kind of obvious but quite implicit kind of collaboration between different countries to kind of mimic this kind of political system or system of knowledge in the the way in which the university is built around different countries so on. So. Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. Um, certainly in the 19th century, almost every country was copying Germany. 
Um, France even reformed its universities to be more like German. Um, and uh, some of the really significant moments were, for example, when Japan uh, modernized its um, uh, military as well as its university and, and business and so on. And that's all sort of setting itself up for the 20th century. And most of that was copying um, Germany. And they probably did a better job than Germany did in terms of how, the, the scale at which um, they were sort of rationalized, uh, the society. Um, other places were South America, Chile, um, for example, although South America has a different tradition, going back to, I think it's the Cordoba, uh, Argentina. So they have a slightly independent um, kind of model of what a good university is, but I think that's from the early 20th century. At the time, uh, the South Americans were trying to also pick up on Germany, Turkey, or Ottoman Empire was also doing this, and, and Britain. So um, of all the countries, I would say Britain probably has the most uh, autonomy and sort of idiosyncrasy because it's got this long tradition going back to the 17th century scientific revolution. Um, and just in general, Britain doesn't really follow other countries very well. It sort of like adapts what other people are doing. Um, but there is still this shift towards PhDs and research. And I think I think that's the most significant change is, is going from Britain in a lot of ways really reformed the undergraduate curriculum in the 19th century. And that was then exported um, around the world uh, as well alongside the independent schools and public school curriculum and so on, uh, especially to today's Commonwealth countries. But um, but uh, at the advanced special, the idea of like specialized disciplines, PhDs, that that to me starts in Germany, and and people were modeling themselves off of what Germans were doing. Very interesting. Can I suggest another um, guiding principle that runs all the way through the whole two hundred years and before, and that is the concentration where you have spare resources allied to political power. And I think it works across all the various variants that you, that you mention, and that you can see, therefore, the shift moving around. Um, and it, it, makes, it, it, it makes a more coherent story, because you then begin to understand the aristocracy were declining because they were losing resources. The church, uh, which have been powerful and international, becomes national and declines in 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 its in its political holdings, and 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 so on and so on. Yeah. The industrial revolution creates new wealth for new people of a kind that. So it's about disposable income combined with with political power. I just would want one gloss, and that is about. I agree with you about the German. Uh, a direction towards scientific uh, investigation. But it's very interesting that immediately after the Second World War, the United States in particular began to invest very heavily in research per se, in a way that actually then drove research again internationally. And it was, a, again, a government decision to make that choice. Yes. Now, thank you for both of those um, comments, both of which are very useful ways of thinking further, because I think that is right about the resources. Um, and if I think back to, I didn't get into it as much, but the, um, why the German universities were universities um, was due to this, um, during the French Revolution, uh, France um, dissolved the property of the church and so on, which Britain had done centuries ago with the dissolution of the monasteries. But um, France um, sort of claimed the resources of the church in France and, and used that to set up some of these grand calls. 
But in Germany, uh, they were, because they were the colonized or, or, or conquered power, there was just extraction from France. So taxes, uh, soldiers, and um, ba basic uh, resources. But they were expected to sort of modernize. Um, and it's also important to think that Germany was 330 separate um, states at that time. So it wasn't like Germany. But uh, Prussia was the one that modernized the most, and the University of Berlin was very important in, in some of these regards. Um, but so the universities all of a sudden didn't have any resources left, and the state provided the resources. So that's really one of the biggest innovations that Germany adds, is that the state supports these religious institutions, essentially, because prior to that it would have been churches and local communities, and they weren't very big. I mean, there's only 22, and there were, there were small operations. But Germany, the German state, especially because they wanted to train this massive civil service, um, they sort of started pouring money into it. Especially the law faculty was the most significant. Um, and, and the scientific and the, the laboratories and so on, um, a lot of those are coming out of um, industry, and so there's spare resources in, in uh, the Rhine and Ruhr valleys in northwest um, Germany, but that's not necessarily what's driving the universities. Um, I, I think it's it's more that the state is is, is putting that money in, and that's that would then also confirm what the Americans do at, in the post-war period. The only exception, and this is something that I did track in my doctorate, is in America, large philanthropies like Carnegie and uh, Rockefeller Foundation essentially rationalize the education and higher education systems in the U.S. And they do the same work that in Germany is done by Althoff in a, in a formal government ministry. But in America, it's like autonomous from the state that they then sort of encourage certain things to be funded in certain ways. Um, and that actually means that the, the kind of financial elites and so on have more control in America, whereas in Germany it was very much a kind of like cultural, it, it was more like German national myths and, and, and so forth. Like there was a real kind of nation building sense, whereas in America is much more of a kind of how do we men how do we use these to access markets and have uh, cultural exchange and, and so on around the world. Yeah, I think I'm particularly interested in the um, the sort of comments you made about Strasbourg, I think you know, so, so this is a model where there's and it seems to be a bit of a trope in the foundation of universities, there's some kind of problem of disunity in the culture. But the solution is create a university rather than something for it. So it's a similar kind of, you see similar thing in the, um, uh, in the south of the University of Virginia. There's a problem that we don't have enough sort of southern, southern elite culture will create a university. And to some extent, I think it might be there in Trinity College Dublin as well. There's a sort of problem of you know, maintaining anglicanism. I just, I guess, I wonder, is, why is it a trope that universities are appeal to, to do that. It makes, it makes a certain amount of intuitive sense to me that being in a university, of course, you know, think, yeah, of course, we can, <laughs> we can shore up the culture. But why is it that, that yeah, universities they turn to rather than other, other institutions for that purpose? I, I mean, is it a trope? I mean, is that, these strike is the work in all across the various cases? So. Yeah, so uh, I, I don't know exactly why in every instance, but um, actually following up on what I was just describing with Carnegie, I spent a lot of time looking at um, the evolution of Andrew Carnegie's philanthropy and, and uh, eventually leading to what was the Carnegie Commission for Higher Education, which really they did like 160 um, manuals on how to run universities that were sort of copied around the world. But um, the Carnegie started off, he was a Scottish, I think first generation Scottish immigrant. And he really hated the aristocracy in Britain. And so his main uh, first political cause was to get rid of any idea of landed wealth in Britain. 
So he bought up a lot of newspapers like Rupert Murdoch style and tried to influence people and it had no effect. Like he was really disappointed in how much effort he put into creating these new newspapers to have this particular message and it didn't change politics. So that led him to realize, well, the public must be uneducated. And then that shifted him towards this public libraries and, and the kind of idea that the public needs to learn to read. So he would buy these buildings if the local communities would run them. Um, and then that wasn't enough because it was essentially this kind of conflict of like, why don't the masses do the right? Like, why don't they understand what is the right thing that I want them to believe? And it's kind of, uh, 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 to me, it's a sort of, anyway, he then goes on to then fund teachers' pensions and tries to get rid of what he calls sham universities, which leads to the Carnegie Classification Code and so forth. So it's to basically say, these are the good universities. We should put all our money into those. These are the rubbish ones. I don't like, we're not going to help them at all. But, um, and creates this kind of hierarchy within the U.S. system. Uh, that's now the, the ranking systems are essentially evolutions of that. But what I think he's, what I think it's doing, and this is a long way of answering your question, is I think there's a certain point at which it's sort of uh, giving up on the idea that the masses are ever going to actually choose the right set of knowledge. Um, and it's just saying, well, in that case, we will educate the elites properly, and then the elites will form a, a, essentially a social network amongst themselves. Um, and there will be unity in that kind of culture almost. Um, and that, I don't think that works. <laughs> I, I, don't think it, I don't think that's actually a solution to the problem that these folks have. But I think that's, that's the train of thought. It's kind of like they want to be Democrats but they actually don't like what the people say. And I've, I've been really interested in tracking the Brexit debate because I'm slightly outside. I've been in the country nine years. I have a British wife and so on. But, um, and, and we've all been very pro-Remain ourselves throughout, like most academics and professionals. But I've been really interested in seeing how the narrative that the majority of the country is stupid has played itself out and that they're just wrong. And so therefore we need to figure out ways to make that not happen rather than, and, and I, I think they're wrong too, but I think it's an interesting way of trying to work that out that hasn't really led to much reflection in terms of like, is it possible we are wrong in some places? Is that, I really, I haven't seen any of that happen. <coughs> I'm going, to, I'm going to squeeze one last question in because I think we've got something uh, from a remote question. We do. This is from Will, who's been watching the live stream. He says, following the earlier question about something else, following math, could this be a platform university? Online degrees, MOOCs, micro-credentials, spans the scale even further, and some of the energy is outside HE at this time. Um, well, I think we're at a, we are at a crossroads for sure. And I think that this third phase that we were talking about, of, it either has to go, I think, towards something like comprehensive, uh, universal, higher education, um, or it's going to retreat backwards. But, and I don't, I think that there's increasing inequalities that are building into the current system, especially through things like rankings. Um, and so that this inequality is continuing to expand, but the trend towards more and more students coming in, I don't think that's going to stop. Um, and I think the, the thing that we need to figure out is how to break that. So it's almost like if you were filling up a container of volume and it just kept getting attenuated in a sort of unequal direction, we need to figure out a way to have people enter higher education without increasing social inequalities. And to, in that sense, I think there probably has to be something more radical than a platform or, or MOOC uh, 
based digital university, I think there would have to be a, a complete break of the links between um, education for jobs, probably things like uh, the admission system uh, that comes into universities where A levels continue to specialize students earlier and earlier in life and they're being tracked and so on. And there's this kind of sense in which there's this conveyor towards jobs. And I think that, that link has to be broken so that universities could do knowledge, something like knowledge for its own sake. But I don't know who's going to fund that. I don't think states have any interest in that, which is why they're not funding it now. The church maybe used to fund it, but they funded a few scholarship students and some fellows. Like there isn't a scale of funding to keep this many academics um, working. So if you don't have the academics working, they can't deliver the digital lectures that then get sent out. So you might be able to come up with other ways of learning um, that are loose and, and less institutionalized and hierarchical, but um, I don't know. I guess that's a, a hedged answer, but it's essentially to say I'm not sure that the digital platforms are going to be enough to break this kind of set of contradictions. At which point I think we have to call a halt with uh, <coughs> past two o'clock now. Um, Eric, thank you very much indeed for, you, for, for a very stimulating this, and I think you can tell from the questions that it's had quite, a, quite an impact. So thank you very much indeed.